All right, well, this is part two, and I left off where I was talking about that Jerusalem is in bondage with her children, and it says that the Jerusalem above is free, that is the mother of us all. So the one in Jerusalem that's in bondage it is the scarlet harlot, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So let me read a little bit of Isaiah 3. Considering that Jerusalem, the sons and daughters of Zion, and the ancient monarchy of Judah is the scarlet harlot, the one that played the harlot against God. Now you'll have to go look at part 1 where I give you all of the scriptures showing it from the scripture. And this is picking up where I left off, so please watch part one, and then come here and watch this part two. Isaiah 3, starting in verse 8. For Jerusalem has stumbled, and Judah has fallen, because they spoke and acted against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. The expression on their faces testifies against them, and like Sodom, they flaunt their sin. They do not conceal it. Woe to them, for they have brought disaster upon themselves. Tell the righteous, it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their labor. Woe to the wicked, disaster is upon them, for they will be repaid with what their hands have done. Youths oppress my people and women rule over them. O oh, my people, your guides mislead you. They turn you from your paths. The Lord arises to contend. He stands to judge the people. The Lord brings this charge against the elders and leaders of his people. You have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. Why do you crush my people and grind the faces of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. The Lord also says, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, walking with heads held high and wanton eyes, prancing and skipping as they go, jingling the bracelets on their ankles, the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will make their foreheads bare. See, she had a whore's forehead. In that day, the Lord will take away their finery, their anklets and headbands and crescents. So they were wearing the crescent. So this predates Muhammad taking the crescent to worship uh, the moon god. Their pendants, their bracelets and veils, their headdresses, ankle chains and sashes, their perfume bottles and charms, their signet rings and nose rings, their festive robes, capes, cloaks, and purses, and their mirrors, linen garments, tiaras, and shawls. Instead of fragrance, there will be a stench. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of styled hair, baldness. Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, shame. Your men will fall by the sword, and your warriors in battle, and the gates of Zion will lament and mourn. Destitute will sit on the ground. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, We will eat our own bread and provide our own clothes. Just let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace. On that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of Israel's survivors. Whoever remains in Zion and whoever is left in Jerusalem will be called holy. All in Jerusalem who are recorded among the living, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains from the heart of Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Now I wanted to say right here that you know they were acting haughty and in Lamentations 512 it says no one would believe that the adversary would enter Jerusalem. And this goes on to my next point that helped me to see that Jerusalem 
is the Scarlet Harlot. In Lamentations 5.16, it says, The crown is fallen from our head. Woe unto us that have sinned. In Revelation 13.3, it says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Revelation 13, 14 says, It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast, who was wounded by the sword, and yet lived. So now I'm going to pick up on that. I'm going to go to Jeremiah 14, and... It says in verse 14, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name, replied the Lord. I did not send them, or appoint them, or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, a worthless divination, the futility and delusion of their own minds. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who prophesy in my name. I did not send them, yet they say, No sword or famine will touch this land. By sword and famine, these very prophets will meet their end, and the people to whom they prophesy will be thrown into the streets of Jerusalem because of famine and sword. There will be no one to bury them or their wives, their sons or their daughters. I will pour out their own evil upon them. You are to speak this word to them. My eyes overflow with tears day and night. They do not cease, for the virgin daughter of my people has been shattered by a crushing blow, a severely grievous wound. If I go out to the country, I see those slain by the sword. If I enter the city, I see those ravaged by famine. For both prophet and priest travel to a land they do not know. So they were the ones that had the grievous, severe wound by the sword and yet lived in the book of Revelation. Psalm 38 says, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath, for your arrows have pierced me deeply and your hand has pressed down upon me. There is no soundness in my body because of your anger. There's no rest in my bones because of my sin, for my iniquities have overwhelmed me. They are a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds are foul and festering because of my sinful folly. I am bent and brought low. All day long I go about mourning, for my loins are full of burning pain, and no soundness remains in my body. I am numb and badly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. And this is a psalm written by King David of the tribe of Judah. All right, I want to go to Jeremiah 10, starting in verse 17, the coming captivity of Judah. Gather up your belongings from this land, you who live under siege, for this is what the Lord says. Behold, at this time I will sling out the inhabitants of the land and bring distress upon them so that they may be captured. Woe to me because of my brokenness. My wound is grievous. But I said, this is truly my sickness and I must bear it. My tent is destroyed and all its ropes are snapped. My sons have departed from me and are no more. I have no one left to pitch my tent or set up my curtains. For the shepherds have become senseless. They do not seek the Lord. Therefore they have not prospered, and all their flocks is scattered. Listen, the sound of a report is coming, a great commotion from the land to the north. The cities of Judah will be made a desolation, a haunt for jackals. I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not his own. No one who walks directs his own steps. Correct me, O Lord, but only with justice, not in your anger, or you will bring me to nothing. 
pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you and on the families that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob. They have consumed him and finished him off. They have devastated his homeland. So Jerusalem is the one that had the wound by a sword and yet lived that we see um, since the beast is a king according to Daniel in chapter 7 and it's the kingdom that he rules then we know that an image that's being made to the beast or of the beast is something that's going to pertain to Israel or the monarchy we see in Jeremiah 14 this is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the drought Judah mourns and her gates languish her people wail for the land and a cry goes up from Jerusalem the nobles send their servants for water they go to the cisterns but find no water their jars return empty they are ashamed and humiliated they cover their heads the ground is cracked because no rain has fallen on the land the farmers are ashamed they cover their heads and this is a sign of lamentation and mourning because they had the wound by a sword in the head and what that really is saying in Revelation is the monarchy the king is the head of state and I figured this out and I realized that they were the ones whose monarchy had the wound by a sword and yet they lived and the monarchy is going to be restored in the book of Revelation to an earthly king before Jesus returns from heaven at the end of the seven year time of Jacob's trouble. It says even the doe in the field deserts her newborn fawn because there's no grass. While donkeys stand on barren heights, they pant for air like jackals. Their eyes fail for lack of pasture. Although our iniquities testify against us, O Lord, act for the sake of your name. Indeed, our rebellions are many, and we've sinned against you. O hope of Israel, its Savior in times of distress, why are you like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who stays but a night? Why are you like a man, taken by surprise, like a warrior, powerless to save? Yet you are among us, O Lord, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. So let me explain that what happened when it's in Lamentations, and Jeremiah wrote Lamentations because... You know, he was in sackcloth and ashes, weeping for the destruction of Jerusalem and the fact that the people were taken to Babylon because they failed to listen to him. And in that verse in Lamentations 5.12, where it said, No one would believe that the adversary would enter Jerusalem. So she believed so much that God was with her, even in the you know, sins and harlotry that she was committing against God himself, that she thought she was all protected by God, even though they were sacrificing their children to these idols and then coming into the Lord's house and defiling it and having the, that blood of their children on their hands. And many other things, um, you know, I discussed all about the harlotry that was going on that she was sleeping with the uh, Assyrians and then the Chaldeans the Babylonians and committing fornication and she had all these abominations so this is what we see in the scarlet harlot the mother of abominations in the book of Revelation so this is what I believe is going to happen in the future, that they actually believe that God is approving of what they're doing by bringing about the one world religion because they want to bring everybody to Jerusalem no matter what God they're worshiping. And this is allowing these abominations to come to Jerusalem. And then, of course, 
the Lord is going to come down from heaven and strike Nebuchadnezzar's statue on the feet and destroy these um, kingdoms that are tainted with Babylon. So she brought forth Babylon into the many waters of the different countries where she was exiled. And so they do not believe that anybody's going to come into the land and do anything bad to them because they think that God is with them and that they're in some sort of way superior to the Gentiles. And um, I even had one Israeli person tell me, you're not one of us. So, you know, didn't want to have anything to do with me because I was believing in Jesus as the King of Kings. In Jeremiah 3, it talks about the polluted land. And, of course, Jeremiah was the prophet sent to warn the kings of Judah to repent and turn from their wicked ways and to return to God and, you know, warn them that they would be taken captive to Babylon. So this is talking about the polluted land in verse 1 of chapter 3 of Jeremiah. They say, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Now see, Israel was supposed to be God's wife. So he's talking about them. Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Lift up thine eyes into the high places, and see where thou hast been lean with, in the ways which thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness. And thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there have been no latter rain, and thou hadst a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. I would like to read Ezekiel 45, verse 9. Thus says the Lord God, Enough, O princes of Israel, put away violence and oppression, and execute justice and righteousness. Cease your evictions of my people, declares the Lord God. The next part of this is another piece of the puzzle that came to me while I was writing my book. This is really what got me understanding from the Holy Spirit that Jerusalem is the Scarlet Harlot, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots. And I want to explain how I piece this together to you. Now think about this, it refers to the nations as the nations. So the person that it's talking about is not from the nations. It's Israel, it's Judah, it's Jerusalem, and God's people. Mystery Babylon. After this I saw another angel descending from heaven with great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his glory, and he cried out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a lair for demons and a haunt for every unclean spirit, every unclean bird, and every detestable beast. All the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her immorality. The kings of the earth were immoral with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown wealthy from the extravagance of her luxury. And then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people so that you will not share in her sins or contract any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Give back to her as she has done to others. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion in her own cup. As much as she has glorified herself and lived in luxury, give her the same measure of torment and grief. And this is the verse that helped me to figure out that Jerusalem was Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation. In her heart, she says, I sit as queen. I am not a widow, 
and will never see grief or mourning. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and grief and famine, and she will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. So it's that verse right there. In her heart she says, I sit as queen, I am no widow, and will never see mourning. And that is Revelation 18, 7, and the latter half of verse 7. So let's go back to when they were taken to Babylon. And in Lamentations, when they were in mourning, and see what it says there, Lamentations 1, verse 1. Listen carefully to Lamentations 1, verse 1, compared to that verse I just gave you in Revelation 18, 7. How deserted lies the city, Jerusalem, once so full of people. How like a widow is she, who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night, tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her, and they have become her enemies. After affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations, and she finds no resting place. After affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no rest. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed festivals. All her gateways are desolate. Her priests groan. Her young women grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile, captive before the foe. All the splendor has departed from daughter Zion. Her princes are like deer that find no pasture. In weakness they have fled before the pursuer. In the days of her affliction and wandering, Jerusalem remembers all the treasures that were hers in days of old. When her people fell into enemy hands, there was no one to help her. Her enemies looked at her and laughed at her destruction. Jerusalem has sinned greatly and so has become unclean. All who honored her despise her, for they have all seen her naked, and she groans and turns away. Her filthiness clung to her skirts. She did not consider her future. Her fall was astounding, and there was no one to comfort her. Look, Lord, on my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy laid hands on all her treasures. She saw pagan nations enter her sanctuary, those you had forbidden to enter your assembly. All her people groan as they search for bread. They barter their treasures for food to keep themselves alive. Look, Lord, and consider, for I am despised. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look around and see. Is any suffering like my suffering that was inflicted on me, that the Lord brought on me in the day of his fierce anger? From on high he sent fire, sent it down into my bones. He spread a net for my feet and turned me back. He made me desolate, faint all day long. My sins have been bound into a yoke. By his hands they were woven together. They have been hung on my neck, and the Lord has sapped my strength. He has given me into the hands of those I cannot withstand. So that verse, Lamentations 1.1, is the key. How deserted lies Jerusalem, once so full of people. How like a widow is she, who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. And so they're mourning and lamentating over their grief of the destruction of Jerusalem and the holy temple. So God is saying in Revelation 18, 7, again, I just want to repeat how that connects. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen 
and am no widow. In mourning I shall never see. So she's denying she's the one in Lamentations 1.1. 1, 1. And that's Revelation 18.7. And that is the biggest clue that Jerusalem and her people and the ancient monarchy are the scarlet harlot, mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So let's now look at Ezekiel 22, the sins of Jerusalem. Verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, will you judge her? Will you pass judgment on the city of bloodshed? Then confront her with all her abominations. Now remember, she's the mother of harlots of the abominations of the earth. And tell her that this is what the Lord God says. O city, who brings her own doom by shedding blood within her walls and making idols to defile herself. You are guilty of the blood you have shed, and you are defiled by the idols you have made. You have brought your days to a close and have come to the end of your years. Therefore I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mockery to all the lands. Those near and far will mock you, O infamous city, full of turmoil. See how every prince of Israel within you has used his power to shed blood. Father and mother are treated with contempt. Within your walls, the foreign resident is exploited. The fatherless and the widow are oppressed. You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. Among you are slanderous men bent on bloodshed. Within you are those who eat on the mountain shrines and commit acts of indecency. In you, they have uncovered the nakedness of their fathers. In you, they violate women. One man commits an abomination with his brother's wife. Another wickedly defiles his daughter-in-law. And yet another violates his sister, his own father's daughter. In you they take bribes to shed blood. You engage in usury, take excess interest, and extort your neighbors. But me you have forgotten, declares the Lord God. Now look, I strike my hands together against your unjust gain and against the blood you have shed in your midst. Will you courage endure or your hands be strong in the day I deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and I will act. I will disperse you among the nations and scatter you throughout the lands. I will purge your uncleanness. So this is the scarlet harlot that is scattered and sits on many waters. And some of the people have gone back to Jerusalem and Israel and others are still in the nations. Will your courage endure or your hands be strong in the day that I deal with you? And when you have defiled yourself in the eyes of the nations, then you will know that I am the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. All of them are copper, tin, iron, and lead inside the furnace. They are but the dross of silver. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says, because all you have become dross. Behold, I will gather you into Jerusalem, just as one gathers silver, copper, iron, lead, and tin into the furnace to melt with a fiery blast, so I will gather you in my anger and wrath, leave you there, and melt you. Yes, I will gather you together and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you will be melted within the city. As silver is melted in a furnace, so you will be melted within the city, and then you will know that I, the Lord, have poured out my wrath upon you. Israel's wicked leaders. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, say to her, in the day of indignation, you are a land that has not been cleansed, upon which no rain has fallen. The conspiracy of the princes in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing its prey. They devour the people, seize the treasures and precious things, and multiply the widows within her. 
Her priests do violence to my law and profane my holy things. They make no distinction between the holy and the common, and they fail to distinguish between the clean and the unclean. They disregard my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. Her officials within her are like wolves tearing their prey, shedding blood, and destroying lives for dishonest gain. Her prophets whitewash these deeds by false visions and lying divinations, saying, This is what the Lord God says when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and the needy and have exploited the foreign resident without justice. I searched for a man among them to repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I should not destroy it. But I found no one, so I have poured out my indignation upon them and consumed them with the fire of my fury. I have brought their ways down upon their own heads, declares the Lord. So now we're going to see that she's the one that had the wound in the head by the sword and yet lived. And we see her in the book of Revelation. So she's the one that's got the wound in the head by the sword and yet lived. And the king, remember, is the head of state. So the monarchy was basically, it came to an end. The, I told you that the withered arm, that the withered hand that Jesus healed, he was signifying that their monarchy had come to an end and he was their king. And also he healed the blind eyes and the right eye, they say, of the Antichrist is utterly darkened. Well, that's because King Zedekiah's eyes were blinded, and Israel is blind in part until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So we've got in Ezekiel 21, God's sword of judgment. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Jerusalem and pray against the sanctuaries. Prophesy against the land of Israel and tell her that this is what the Lord says. I am against you and I will draw my sword from its sheath and cut off from you both the righteous and the wicked because I will cut off both the righteous and the wicked. My sword will be unsheathed against everyone from south to north, then all flesh will know that I, the Lord, have taken my sword from its sheath, not to return it again. But you, son of man, groan, groan before their eyes with a broken heart and bitter grief, and when they ask, why are you groaning, you are to say, because of the news that is coming, every heart will melt and every hand will go limp, every spirit will faint, and every knee will turn to water. Yes, it's coming, and it will surely happen, declares the Lord God. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy, and tell them that this is what the Lord says. A sword, a sword, sharpened and polished. It is sharpened for the slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. Should we rejoice in the scepter of my son? The sword despises every such stick. The sword is appointed to be polished, to be grasped in the hand. It is sharpened and polished to be placed in the hand of the slayer. Cry out and wail, O son of man, for the sword is wielded against my people. It is against all the princes of Israel. So that's the deadly wound by a sword, and yet they lived, because the monarchy is going to be restored of Judah with an earthly king. And this is what they plan to do, perhaps just before they build the third temple. Therefore, strike your thigh. Surely testing will come. And what if even the scepter which the sword despises does not continue, declares the Lord God? And let me just say that Jesus, the Messiah, is the scepter. So then, 
Son of man, prophesy and strike your hands together. Let the sword strike two times, even three. It is a sword that slays, a sword of great slaughter, closing in on every side, so that their hearts may melt and many may stumble. I have appointed at all their gates a sword for slaughter. Yes, it is ready to flash like lightning. It is drawn for slaughter. Slash to the right, set your blade to the left, wherever your blade is directed. I too will strike my hands together and will satisfy my wrath. I, the Lord, have spoken. And then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Now you, son of man, mark out two roads for the sword of the king of Babylon to take, both starting from the same land, and make a signpost where the road branches off to each city. Mark out one road for the sword to come against Rabbah of the Ammonites and another against Judah and to fortify Jerusalem. For the king of Babylon stands at the fork in the road at the junction of the two roads to seek an omen. And he shakes the arrows, he consults the idols, he examines the liver. In his right hand appears the portent for Jerusalem where he is to set up battering rams to call for the slaughter, to lift a battle cry to direct the battering rams against the gates, to build a ramp and to erect a siege wall. It will seem like a false omen to the eyes of those who have sworn allegiance to him, but it will draw attention to their guilt and take them captive. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says, because you have drawn attention to your guilt, exposing your transgressions so that your sins are revealed in all your deeds, because you have come to remembrance. Now, this is what it says in Revelation, that all of the sins have been piled up and they've come to the Lord's remembrance. You shall be taken in hand, and you O profane and wicked prince of Israel, the day has come for your final punishment. This is what the Lord God says. Remove the turban and take off the crown. Things will not remain as they are. So this is talking about the head holding the crown of the ancient monarchy, and that is what I understood the Holy Spirit telling me is in Revelation that the deadly sword wound by the head and yet they lived is the ancient monarchy and it's referring to this part of history. Exalt the lowly and bring low the exalted. A ruin, a ruin, I will make it a ruin. So that's kind of like Babylon. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. And it will not be restored until the arrival of, capital H-I-M, to whom it belongs. It will not be restored until Jesus comes, the true king of Judah that will reign forever, to whom I have assigned the right of judgment. Isn't that an incredible verse? So he's telling them, remove the turban and take off the crown. Things will not remain as they are. And it will not be restored until the arrival of him to whom it belongs, who has the right of judgment. And that's Messiah Jesus. But instead, they're going to reject their king and keep rejecting him, and they're going to set up an earthly king, who I do believe the anointed one in their eyes is going to be King Charles III, who claims to have a genealogical chart leading back to King David and Solomon, plus he was circumcised by a famous rabbi that the queen brought in when he was born exactly in 1948 when Israel was born. So this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. I believe that pertains to this king that was born then, when Israel was born, they're going to pick to sit on their throne of David, and all of these things will be fulfilled in this generation of this king that's going to be chosen as the anointed one. So it says, now prophesy, son of man, and declare that this is what the Lord God says concerning the Ammonites and their contempt. 
A sword, a sword, is drawn to slaughter. Polish to consume, to flash like lightning, while they offer false visions for you and lying divinations about you to be placed on the necks of the wicked who are slain, whose day has come, and the time of her final punishment. Return the sword to its sheath. In the place where you were created, in the land of your origin, I will judge you, and I will pour out my anger upon you. I will breathe the fire of my fury against you. I will hand you over to brutal men skilled in destruction, and you will be fuel for the fire. Your blood will stain your own land. You will not be remembered, for I, the Lord, have spoken. And we see in Revelation 13, in verse 12, and this beast exercised all the authority of the first beast. And I believe that that Jerusalem, the ancient monarchy, is all the first beast and caused the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose mortal wound had been healed. And that was in Revelation 13, 14, and it said, it ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast, and a beast is a king, according to the prophet Daniel, who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So this is the ancient monarchy, and God brought it to an end with the sword, and it has the wound by a sword, and yet it's going to be revived. And we saw in Jeremiah 21, 9, whoever stays in the city of Jerusalem will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. They will escape with their lives. Now I'm going to read Jeremiah 44, 9. Have ye forgotten all the wickedness of your fathers and the wickedness of the kings of Judah and the wickedness of their wives and your own wickedness and the wickedness of your wives which they have committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? They are not humbled even unto this day. Neither have they feared nor walked in my law nor in my statutes that I set before you and before your fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for evil, and to cut off all Judah. And I will take the remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt, to sojourn there. Now there was, you know, some people that escaped and did not go to Babylon, such as the princesses of Judah. They went with Jeremiah to Mizpah, and then from Mizpah, they were asking Jeremiah, please ask God, you know, should we go to Egypt or not? And God told Jeremiah to tell them, no, do not seek your solution in Egypt, but stay here in the land of Israel. Well, they did it anyway, and they went there, and God told them that they would fall by the sword. So that was part of the royal line there of Judah. And I will take the remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, and they shall all be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. They shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. They shall die from the least even to the greatest by the sword and by famine, and they shall be an excretion and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. For I will punish them that dwell in the land of Egypt as I have punished Jerusalem by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, so that none of the remnant of Judah which are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall escape or remain, that they should return into the land of Judah, to the which they have a desire to return to dwell there, for none shall return but such as shall escape. And it says, Then all the men which knew their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But we will certainly do whatever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven, 
and to pour out drink offerings unto her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. So they didn't think that evil would come against them because they just thought that they were better than everybody else. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? The final judgment. Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to the men and the women and all the people which had given him that answer, saying, The incense that ye burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye, your fathers, your kings, and your princes, and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them, and came it not into his mind, so that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings, and because of the abominations which ye have committed. Now she's the mother of harlots, the mother of the abominations of the earth. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day. Because you've burned incense and because you've sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor his statutes, nor in his testimonies, therefore this evil is happened unto you as at this day. And moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people and to all the women, Hear the word of the Lord, all Judah that are in the land of Egypt. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled with your hand, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Therefore, hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, said the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God liveth. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by famine until there be an end of them. Yet a small number that escape the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah. And all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose word shall stand, mine or theirs. And this shall be a sign unto you, saith the Lord, that I will punish you in this place, that ye may know that my words shall surely stand against you for evil. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies, and into the hand of them that seek his life, as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy that sought his life. So he was blinded by Nebuchadnezzar, his eyes were put out, and he never saw another thing. And since that time, Israel has had no king, they weren't even a nation, and they rejected King Jesus, their Messiah, 2,000 years ago, and they're still continuing, for the most part, in Israel, not to accept their king. So he's got to deal with them.